Greetings all, Dr. Rafael X here with another video with my friend here, Pedro and uh, Gabriel, who wrote a very interesting book, was well, written many books here, but first of all, click on the subscribe button, notifications button, like button, leave a comment, all that good stuff, and um, well, let's, before everything, anything else, let's um, begin with the sign of the cross, shall we, to remember our baptism in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. All right. Well, Pedro Gabriel, thanks for coming on. And uh, just a little bit about him. He's written, um, well, the first book he's written is The Orthodoxy of Amoris Laetitia. He's written Heresy Disguised as Tradition. And this book, which we're going to probably talk about the most, though they're all kind of related, Rigidity, Faithfulness, or Heterodoxy. So I'll put the link on the bottom by the book. Very interesting book. Um, but just a little bit about Pedro. Uh, Pedro. He is a co-founder of the Apologetics website, Where Peter Is, he's and he's currently taking classes of moral theology at the Pontifical University of the Holy Cross. He is also a medical oncologist. Interesting perspective he brings on. And uh, an internet journalist and a published writer of Catholic novels. So thank you very much, uh, Pedro, for coming on. And um, yes, rigidity. We know the Pope has talked a lot about rigidity, kind of condemning it. If you can give us the gist of your book, um, maybe what we mean uh, or what you mean by rigidity, um, kind of building off of what Pope Francis is saying by that, because a lot of people kind of uh, they accuse Pope Francis of being ambiguous. And some people say it's a weaponized ambiguity which because it has some other type of intention. But um, but yeah, so if you can kind of explain this notion of rigidity and uh, from there we'll kind of build on. Sure. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to meet you here, to be here. And it's also, I also thank you for the your kind words regarding my book, uh, regarding your question then. Uh, uh, I do not believe that we can say that Pope Francis is ambiguous if, since he has used this word consistently and he has used this word uh, always in the same contexts. And if, in fact, what I have done in, in my book was to do a, a search on the Vatican website to um, to see all the entries that would uh, of rigidity in Pope Francis's documents or speeches and, and whatnot, and see in what context he would use the, the word rigidity, and if some patterns would pop up. Uh, I do not believe it's a matter of ambiguity; is a matter of Pope Francis has not uh, defined it uh, like in a dictionary way. He prefers, he prefers to describe it in its multiple facets. So if I would have to summarize what rigidity is, according to Pope Francis, uh, I would say that it's mostly, it's not, uh, it's not a teaching, it's not, a, 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 not even an ideology, it's a symptom, it's a, a spiritual symptom or a symptom of a spiritual uh, inner state in which the person adheres so tightly to the rules and to the theoretical tenets of the faith that they end up perverting them by, go, by moving away from the spirit of the law, just adhering to the latter to, in a way that will, uh, that it was not what was intended according to its spirit, and that eventually leads to uh, sacrificing charity, which is the, the ultimate value of our faith. Right, right. No, that's, that's interesting. And so, so the thing is, I think you associate, and, and Pope Francis, Pope Francis associates rigidity with a type of extrinsicism, right? Um, which is, I believe, it's a very legitimate concern 
um, pre-Vatican, because uh, pre-Vatican II, because this was there were a lot of abuses. There was a type of formalist spirit, even mm -hmm. liturgically, where every it was focused, uh, kind of like the outward expression, outward works were focused, but without, as you mentioned throughout your book, the internal spirit, and that's a big problem. Definitely, we need kind of that law of charity has to rule all things. But this extrinsicism, I think today in a type is, is like a red herring because uh, I don't think I don't see it as much as a problem. I think Pope Francis is kind of he's projecting that spirit that's very pre-Vatican, which is legit. Uh, this extrinsicism is, is a, definitely a danger. But I think now now because we're seeing people focusing on the extrinsic, we automatic automatically jump to extrinsicism, if that makes sense. And I think also that a type of internalism has taken hold where it's all about the interior. It doesn't really matter what you do as long as you are interiorly, um, you know, and, and we'll get to that with Amoris Laetitia, you're, you're interiorly good. Like you're, 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 you're at peace with God in your conscience, almost in a subjective way, but you don't need any extrinsic justification for that. So I don't know if you want to comment at that, if that makes sense. Well, uh, the, yes, it makes sense, but it it has it is actually a bit more complex because not all extrinsicisms are bad, uh, not all intrinsicisms are good. And um, regarding Amoris Laetitia, it's also more complex than that because what you described is more what we call the fundamental option theory, which was condemned by John Paul II in Veritatis right. Splendor. But that's not properly what Amor's Letizia is about. It's more about the subjective culpability of the sinner. It's not that the sinner is good. It's whether he is culpable enough to be sinning in a mortal way so that he would not take the Eucharist. Now, regarding extremism, yeah, I mean, of course, that there is a legitimate concern about um, about the ex the extrinsic and the exterior and uh, and uh, the way we worship the liturgy. I agree that there have been many liturgical abuses, but what I, I actually uh, also explain in the book of rigidity is that. Namely, on chapter um, chapter seven uh, on medieval heresies, right. is that usually rigidity comes as a reaction to a legitimate concern, and that legitimate concern would not exist if there were no problems. So I can completely agree that there might be a problem of intrinsicism that many heterodox moral theologians have tried to make it all subjective. They have tried to make it everything about the interior. Pope Benedict legitimately reacted against it when he spoke about the dictatorship of relativism, completely true. But the problem is when we react in a way that uh, loses the nuance and the complexities of reality, we end up on rigidity. And this can actually happen even for you know progressives or people who are more secularized. They see these social injustices, they see all these bad things happening, and then they re react in a way that they sacrifice everything, including church teaching, to appease or to respond to these legitimate concerns. That's also kind of rigidity, responding always the same way without discernment uh, to, to uh, a legitimate concern. And for end on chapter seven of my book, I talk about the legitimate concern of going against, of fighting against church ecclesial corruption. That's very good, but there are different ways of doing it. There's the way of St. Francis of Assisi, who fought against corruption from within the church and thus was able to reform it properly. And then there is the, the fight of, against corruption of the Reformation in which they were so concerned about the indulgences, which were bad, the selling of indulgences, the way that it was made, that it was done was bad, uh, but they, they fought so much against it that they ended up outside of the church and they sacrificed something that cannot be sacrificed. So that's rigidity as well. And so 
I think that Pope Francis is identifying a proper um, a proper problem amongst those who have these legitimate concerns about liturgical abuses, lack of reverence, but they end up focusing so much on the exterior that they end up sacrificing things that are more important and they may end up, you know, scaring people away, which is not the point. The point is to bring the people here to our, to the interior of the church and try to make them follow these rules, follow the exterior as well, as well as the interior. But I mean, there's this idea that if those people, if, if we scare away these people, it's okay. We are the ones who, you know, are uh, orthodox. We are the ones who know. We are, so as long as we have this walled community that is protecting the purity of the church, doesn't matter. So again, we are sacrificing an important value, the value of evangelization, which is particularly important nowadays with so much secularization, with so much relativism, we are sacrificing it in order to maintain some kind of orthodoxy uh, and, uh, some, and a kind of liturgical purity uh, that in the end does not have faith in the church, in the guidance of the church, uh, doesn't have faith that the Pope will keep protecting the faith even if he listens to the, those who are not orthodox, and he does not believe that the church was doing well uh, or did well when it reformed the liturgy. So only the pre-Vatican II liturgy is acceptable. The new liturgy is not acceptable. So that's, right, right. Uh, that's I think, what the problem is and what Pope Francis is talking about. Right, right. Well, there, there is, see, it's interesting because I see more of the contrary uh, problem in general where there's so much focus on the interior that um, there, there's, and you're right, one extreme leads to another. Extre extreme extrinsicism can li literally lead to, a, like a, a rigidity can lead to a laxism and vice versa. As you write in the chapter about scrupulosity and, and laxity, definitely the extremes meet. But, but isn't it true that a lot of people say, um, again, this is not anecdotal. I, I think this, you could generalize this, that people are usually, they focus on the interior and say, okay, I, I'm, I'm good with God interiorly, but I don't, I don't practice. I, I literally heard a politician in Spain, actually, who said, I'm, I'm extremely religious, but I don't practice. I think, so I think there's this thirst for the extrinsic manifestation and even in a meticulous manner of the faith. I remember someone told me the other day, um, and, and they go to new mass, they don't go to Latin, traditional Latin mass, but they, we, we were in a military funeral and they told me, and, and it's rigid, quote unquote rigid, right? Because it's very, uh, very structured, very exacting in the movements and everything. And that, and that conveys a type of, that kind of omits of a type of a, a devotion in the sense where you look at that and you're like, wow, this is amazing. Those movements. So it, it is true that, those movements could so I don't think this is not your position that those that that extreme the extrinsic acts can cause um, kind of the dryness interior dryness but that uh, the too much too much focusing on that but what I'm trying to say is that uh, the extrinsic I think I think there's a, a thirst for the extrinsic because people are seeing how that can kind of enhance foment the interior life and that's why i mean demographically even the new york times has written on this the the latin mass is kind of it's on the increase uh it, it, there is a little there's changing on that i mean i think that the novus ordo of course there's a traditional way of celebrating the form but the traditional latin mass there's something there that um uh, i have a protestant friend who went to traditional latin mass he has no idea what's going on but because of the extrinsic practices which which convey a, um, a mystery really he he was kind of shocked by wow so what's going on here the problem with this kind of internalist spirit it kind of wants to make everything kind of practical and devoid things of symbols but maybe i'm going a little bit off topic i don't know if you wanted to comment on that if not sure, okay. sure. I, I would i would like to again uh for example my again my book talks about uh the first chapter already to dispel our doubts I talk about how rigidity is not the answer to laxism and identify laxism as a problem. 
Uh, it's not that for us to be faithful, we need to oppose laxism in a way that we end up rigid. No, it's right. about finding a virtuous golden mean between the laxity and rigidity. So, of course, uh, it's not that I'm advocating that people will, again, react so strongly against rigidity that will fall onto laxism. Again, this is this is not the point. The point is to find a, 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 a way in which a person will discern on each situation, taking into consideration the complexities of reality, what is the best option. Sometimes the best option is to be to end uh, uh, or fall on the or err on the side of rigidity, sometimes on the side of laxity. Sometimes you need to be flexible. Sometimes you need to be stern. Depends on the situation. It's We should not always end up with the same solution for every single problem. It's like if a hammer that nails every nail, it's not like that. Sometimes you have screws. You cannot hammer them. So that's that's one of the that's one of the points. And uh, if you end up always advocating the same the same response, even if the same response is laxity, that is also a kind of rigidity. You're always advocating the same response. But regarding the fact that intrinsicism might be more widespread, I can actually agree. I can actually agree that intrinsicism might be more widespread, and I can also understand that uh, the people, let's call them the traditionalists or conservatives, let's let's call them that. I can understand that they see so this widespread problem and so and they, they see Pope Francis always criticizing them and it, it might seem like it's too like it's disproportionate. But the thing is these people, these Catholics are also the ones who pride themselves of following church teaching where no one else follows, like 90% of Catholics don't even know what humanae vitae is all about, and they follow humanae vitae. They take their faith seriously. So if we are to try to um, turn the tide of this uh, widespread secularism, widespread progressism, these are the Catholics that will need to go from the church and to the world and spread the good news. So what happens if these Catholics are not prepared? Because that's the thing is the 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 enemy is very is very sneaky. Attempt the the Catholics who are like faithful, they will not fall for the same temptations as the lukewarm Catholic. They have their own temptations. And whereas the lukewarm Catholic might fall into laxity and interiorism or intrinsicism, the faithful Catholics will fall on their own temptations. And if they are not on the lookout for that, they will not be able to evangelize because they will only be like a negative version of the lukewarm Catholic. They will eschew correction. They will eschew spiritual progress and a more perfect following of the church teaching because they reject the, the they reject what the living magisterium is telling them. So if the Pope at this crossroads is making a point of criticizing rigidity so much, it's because it's becoming a big problem. It's not just the people who suffer from rigidity. It's not just them. It's all the people who are, they are failing to evangelize because they have this partialized, incomplete, imperfect view of the faith that does not allow correction, does not allow them to move forward because they think they, they already faithful. They don't need, they already know what to, to do. They already, so why, why do we need to be corrected? Well, you always need to be corrected until the day you die. That's part of being a Catholic. Yeah. And, and I'm glad you ended uh, with that um, because I, I like how you talk about the, the, the golden mean between we kind of have to look for that golden mean and you even actually qualify that further with kind of like a 3D dimension type of um, uh, mm -hmm. graph here. Uh, but basically 
the mean between laxity and rigidity. But it, it, what's interesting is that you said that someone who is laxed may accuse someone of being rigid, but that person is actually faithful, right? So the faithfulness is in the the mean, right? Um, yes. So if someone's lax, they they could. So it, it could it depends on also like who the judger, right? The the person who's judging if they're extremely rigid and they're judging someone as lax, that person who they're judging could be faithful. Now yes. the question I have is, I'm not sure because um, it, it seems like a priori you're establishing Pope Francis as the standard in in a, in a virgin as the virtuous standard mm -hmm. ultimately because why? Because I, I think by from what many things that Pope Francis said that he does tend to be laxed, and this is not. I mean, uh, again, the, there's been very many popes in the past who have not been virtuous. I mean, we can agree that not every pope is virtuous. Why is Pope Francis the standard in the sense that maybe him being laxed and criticizing rigid people, he's really criticizing the faithful? You know what I'm saying? Like, why is he the standard? of uh you know rigidity and laxity maybe he is not because i think you're you're placing pope francis in the golden mean so he his his judgment is is the standard uh first of all just to go back a bit i would yeah. i would just like to explain a little bit better what you said about yeah. the perspectives yes. so i on my book i use the um, the 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 virtue of courage and there's the vice of cowardice, which is opposed to courage, but the, the, the vice of recklessness, which is also not courage, is the other extreme. So the courage is the golden mean between recklessness and cowardice. So a coward people will tend to see a courageous person as reckless, whereas a reckless person will see the courageous person as a coward. So it's a matter of that perspective. So, right. uh, of course, a lax person will see the faithful Catholic as rigid, but the rigid Catholic will also see the, the faithful as the lax Catholic. Now, regarding Pope Francis, <clears throat> well, Pope Francis obviously is not impeccable, and I do not mean to think that he is. But I, what I want to say is that I am not placing him as the reference. I'm placing the living magisterium as the reference. Uh, I mean, not necessarily his actions or all his decisions, but his teaching, his what he is on his homilies and on his documents, what he is talking about. Yes, that thing I place as, as a reference. And I believe that that's part of being the, a Catholic. So the living magisterium is considered the authoritative interpreter of the deposit of the faith, be it scripture or tradition. Uh, actually, my previous book, Heresy Discussed Tradition, is more about that. But he, the living magisterium is the authoritative interpreter. The living magisterium is the one in charge of discerning the signs of times to see how to discern how to best apply the, the different parts of the deposit of the faith to the challenges and the circumstances of the time. And from and so I believe that that's uh, a, a central tenet of being a Catholic and being able to uh, not uh, fall into private judgment uh, and go and say, oh, I'm the one who is right. The living magisterium is one who is wrong. No, uh, at least as your default position, you should say that if the, I disagree with living magisterium, I have to start at first with the, with the idea that it's the living magisterium who's right and I am the one who needs to be corrected. That that's And many of these traditionalists or conservative Catholics would agree when it comes to the progressives. The progressives say, oh, I don't, I disagree with the church. The church is the one who needs to, to change. And they will say, no, no, you're the one who needs to learn from the church. But then they will turn around and think that they don't have anything to learn from the church that already know that's also giving scandal this is also this is also not not proper so i do believe that the church guided by the living magisterium which is the pope and the bishops in communion with them their teachings their interpretations 
I do believe that the living magisterium is guided by the Holy Spirit, so I will set them as, as the reference. And throughout the book, I mention many historical heresies, and I eventually end up with the same, with the same uh, result, that those who, um, those who try to be faithful did not remain faithful just by rigidly adhering to the tenets of the faith, but by remaining in unity with the church. And if they remain with, in unity with the church, they could not be rigid. They could even be more flexible, but they ended up as the Orthodox party. And I think we need to learn from history. And that's precisely also what our faith says, I guess. Yeah. What do you say to, because, for example, like with the magisterium, like because Pope Francis does a lot of interviews and you do have you cite interviews especially like on a plane and 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 in other you know uh, televised interviews a lot of these comments on rigidity he he says in these in in these interviews so mm -hmm. those properly speaking are not part of the of, of the magisterium of uh, of the ordinary magisterium uh right as opposed to a document or his, his kind of official teaching. So what do you say that is there actually in the document? Because I don't even actually know. Maybe you can enlighten me on this. Is there, does he mention rigidity in 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 in, in one of his documents? Yes, uh, he mentions rigidity in Evangelii Gaudium. When he talks about neo-Pelagianism and neo-Gnosticism, okay. those are kinds of rigidity as well. I know that I've cited uh, his teachings on rigidity in in uh, other church documents, but most importantly, uh, I do not believe that the main quotes, some quotes might be from his in interviews on papal planes, but most of them are actually from his homilies and audiences, uh, which uh, it's something that is, they are uh, they are such a hidden treasure. And so many people speak of Pope Francis as if he was a materialist or as, he, as, as if he doesn't speak about Jesus. These homilies and these um these uh, audiences, catechesis that he gives on Wednesday audiences, these are uh, such um, an unknown treasure, and he, they are they have so great spiritual insights, and many of his rigidity teachings come from them, and uh, these homilies and these audiences might be their magisterial weight might be low, but they are still a part of the ordinary magisterium of Pope Francis, or for any Pope for that matter. The theology of the body from Pope St. John Paul II was taught in Wednesday audiences. So they have some magisterial weight. And the interviews, they do not have magisterial weight. I can perfectly agree with it. But as Lumen Gentium says, uh, we have to give our submission of mind and will to the magisterium, the ordinary magisterium of the Pope. But sometimes his interventions elsewhere, his manner of speaking might illuminate what he means when he's actually speaking magisterial. So these papal interviews might not be magisterial, but they may show some light on what he means when he speaks of rigidity and contextualize what he means by rigidity. So they also have their value, even though if it's not a magisterial value, they still have a, a, a value. So, yeah. but yes, I know that I also quoted his his teachings and even, he, even in, when, in those teachings in which he does not uh, name rigidity, he is still uh, criticizing uh, attitudes that, are about rigidity. Amoris Laetitia is all has lots of uh, lots about that, in which he says that yeah, I believe that I I understand those who would prefer a more uh, a more uh, rules based pastoral, but I believe that we should not be afraid of dirtying our shoes in the mud of the road. So that's also even if he doesn't say outright that it's rigidity, that's also a part of his teaching on rigidity as well. Yeah. Uh, one of the issues I have, I mean, definitely 
there could be error in the application, like people can apply it wrongly. And, and that's what I think, the, and that's, I think one of the manifestations of, I think there is ambiguity is because, for example, a lot of these, what you would call laxists or very progressives, they, they have, well, there's a plethora of books on Pope Francis, like um, Gary Willis, who is, um, he is a Pulitzer Prize novelist or historian. He's written a book, The Future of the Catholic Church. There's a lot of books written that are not faithful to, to church teaching and that really, um, uh, you know, they really praise Pope Francis as kind of their, um, their, their champion, which is, again, their, their and that's the problem, though. And this whole notion, we talked about this before, which is interesting, this notion of pope splaining is, uh, you know, people take that as a badge of honor. We should be pope splainers by default. And and I agree. But the, the whole notion of being a pope splainer, that very notion is troublesome because if the primary duty of the hierarchy is to guard the deposit of faith, as, as the, the letters, the pastoral letters say, the, the New Testament, the guard deposit of faith there should be uh, the goal is clarity so there shouldn't there shouldn't be allowed for this, uh, this i mean why are the pro the progressives championing pope francis um and without much pushback from the vatican either and it also seems also like the, the father lombardi who's who, he was the secretary of the holy see the press office there um up to 2016 he was almost kind of like in damage control trying to because a, a lot of the press would act, would be shocked at what Pope Francis said, interpret it in a way they see favorable. And then Father Lombardi would have to come out a lot and clarify certain things. So just that, that, that in itself is a problem. And I think you see that from his effects and, and just jumping kind of to law with that. Um, I, I think because law is an analogous, uh, it's an analogous reality that sometimes, and, and I like your your chapter on law is very interesting, but, um, you know, when we talk about epikeia and all that, I'm talking about a lot of topics, but you dress whichever one you want or all of them. But um, I think there can be, we can conflate natural law, which really doesn't have any exception except for invincible ignorance. And, um, uh, well, Thomas Aquinas talks about God accepting uh, or uh, exempting from natural law in the Old Testament. And then like civil law or or even ecclesiastical law. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's that conflation there. Um, uh, again, that's ambiguous, but I'm sorry, go if you want to uh, kind of comment on anything I said, or I can uh, ask a quick question. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, regarding the, starting just with the end, with a very uh, with a very quick note, uh, on the book, I mentioned that epikeia uh, does not apply to, for example, intrinsically evil acts. I say that explicitly. So there are exceptions, of course. The idea is just to show that church teaching contains room for nuance, even though that nuance does not apply always and everywhere, but there is that nuance. And sometimes uh, a person who was who would have this partialized uh, view of the faith might hear of epikeia if they didn't know, because probably no one would tell them uh, from the media and social media that are usually consumed by those people. But he might hear of epikeia and think, oh, this is laxism. But no, it's not. It's a traditional part of church teaching. It's in Thomas Aquinas. It's in Aristotle. So it's good to have some perspective. Of course, mm -hmm. that I did not mean to apply epikeia to uh, for everywhere. Uh, that, there's, that's why there's a need for discernment. Now, uh, regarding the, the Pope's planning and why people saying, try, uh, trying to pull Pope Francis to the liberal side with few, uh, little pushback from the Vatican and Padre Lombardi being in damage control. I would like to say that I am a, I, I am a Pope Splainer. Yes, I'm one of those who use it as a badge of honor, but I have been a Pope Splainer for a longer time than Pope Francis has been a Catholic. Because I do remember the, what's what start what how I started to be an apologist or a pope explainer was actually the way uh, the media would completely try to destroy and subvert the papacy of Benedict, mm -hmm. Benedict the Sixteenth, and 
no one can say that Pope Benedict is an ambiguous teacher, I think. He, he is very clear, very systematic. He is a, a theologian. Um, but even still, they could take a sentence out of context and create a big controversy about it that would paint him, of course, not as a liberal, but like this extremist fundamentalist that he was obviously not. He, If you read his teachings and uh, his, even on church social doctrine, he is very nuanced um, and uh, does not fit that description. So, of course, that we can say that a pope might have a, a style that is more ambiguous than another, but we cannot we cannot underestimate the amount of artificial ambiguity and lack of clarity that exists because a certain media or social media with a certain agenda try as much as possible to comb all these teachings from the popes, and now I'm going to Pope Francis, and uh change it into a dark light okay so liberals are going to try to bring pope francis into their camp that's what they do there's nothing that i could we can do about that because they are not they let's say that uh some liberals might be but let's say that they are not faithful okay so they are going to do what they're gonna do but during the time of pope benedict People like myself and many who are now criticizing Francis, uh, they they did not allow these things to go unchecked. They would write blogs, they would write articles, they would try to clarify as much as possible what the Pope tried to say, and they would investigate and they would refute and would fact check. They would, with Pope Francis, we don't have any of that anymore. I mean, I mean there is, of course, me, uh, the other people at where Peter is. We started this to, started this uh, website to try to, um, to to clarify, and there are many others who have now joined, uh, Michael Lofton and whatnot, but and many others that I that I that I'm not even naming, but. It's not on the same scale as it was during Pope Benedict, because at that time, the institutional Catholic internet presence was all bent in pushing the forward message of Pope Benedict. And that does not exist with Pope Francis. So there is a lot of confusion. Yes, the liberals are trying to put Pope Francis into their camp, but then the conservatives or traditionalists or whatnot, they're letting them. They are actually agreeing with them and saying, yes, yes, Pope Francis is a, is a liberal. See how he's a heretic. And that's, that's not also a good way because the church, the popes, all of them do not fit this mold of liberal, conservative, traditional, progressive. Yes. They are more nuanced than that. And Pope Francis is more nuanced than that. And that's not coming forth. So that's there's we also have to take that into consideration when we talked about ambiguity and and lack of clarity and confusion and all of that. And finally, I would just end up by saying, should the Pope's um, should the Pope's job be to dispel ambiguity? And uh, I just I just look at Jesus and who is our model. And sometimes to bring about a, a truth that was deeper than anything that our human reasoning was used to or could even conceive, many times he was ambiguous. And many times we as Catholic apologists have to dispel some of that ambiguity when he says, call no man father, or when he says about Mary, oh, the the ones who follow my my will are the ones who are my mother and my brothers those those things or when he when he says that why do you call me good only god is good so those statements are ambiguous and now we know now we know um, what they really mean and they don't mean what you what they might seem at first try we are a religion of nuance a religion of complexity uh, who puts things in their proper context but 
uh, this only happened because the church, the, the many good theologians, many saints took these teachings of Jesus and they clarified, they Jesus explained. Uh, and so, of course, the Pope has a, has a duty also to teach and to teach in a clear way. But I know, I think that he, most of all, he needs to try as much as possible to convey these truths, which sometimes cannot fit this rigid mold. And they, he has to convey these truths in the best possible way, in the most pastoral way. And the faithful Catholics who receive these words, who understand them, also have a duty to help digest the, digest them to the to the masses. And I think that ca Catholics on media and social media have, on the most part, failed to bring that mission about. Now, being a Pope explainer is a slur. Before before uh, Pope Francis, it was not. It was just being uh, a good Catholic who uses their their knowledge to to spread the good news. Right, right. Yeah, I, I think it was what was happening deep down um, that people see in Pope Francis, and I think you do you do qualify this issue well. Um, but if you can kind of elaborate on it, this dichotomy between law and freedom, like th there is no dichotomy, there is no um, contradiction here between law and freedom. But it does seem that um, that that there's a constant saying, no, no, we have to fall. We're, we're free. We're not or we're, we're not. And you right here. And maybe you can explain this also because it's tied to it also that the idea that one becomes good by following moral norms uh is actually part of many uh it's it's foreign it's foreign to the christian morality of to mystic and aristotelian principles uh the idea that one becomes good by following moral norms um yeah if you can explain that and kind of how law and freedom are tied are they contradictory are they um are they at odds no they are not contradictory uh because the following the law points towards a proper use of freedom. Uh, the reason, and let's take a secular or civil uh, example. The only reason why I am free to leave my house is because there are laws in place that say that people cannot beat me or kill me, okay? So that the law is a principle of freedom, but there is this idea uh, that is very widespread. That any law is an attempt uh, uh, is like a, an attack on my freedom, mm -hmm. uh, when it's not. And so there is a difference between freedom and you know being a libertine. Okay, there is such a thing as a misuse of freedom. But just like there is a possibility of a misuse of freedom to eschew the law when the law should be followed. There is also the possibility of a misuse of the law that follows law to a to a to an extreme that eschews all the freedom, even when we should be free. And in this sense, <clears throat> I think that it, the the problem lies, and that's what I explain in my book, on uh, on the heart, on an attitude. The libertine, the is a person who does not does not care about the law so he his heart will always see the law as an attack on his freedom but the person who is rigid uh does care so much about the law that he doesn't care about the freedom and that's an error because god wants us to be free the law is a pedagogue that points us towards freedom which is something uh, which is something that we need to take into consideration especially because no one can follow the law on this earth perfectly we can only do it by the grace of god <clears throat> so uh, even the virgin mary who did it did it all only because of the grace of god so um that what this means is that it's an attitude pro attitudinal problem. And what I explain in that chapter is 
what is our attitude towards God? Do we see him as a, a good father or do we see him as a master that gives us all these impossible tasks, but we still have to fulfill them? Otherwise, we end up in hell. And this makes all the difference. And sometimes the, the you see the atheists saying, oh, the if you need God to tell you what is good, then you're not good at all. And there is a point to that. That's also a reaction against an extreme, a, 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 good, con a good concern, because, yeah, I should not be good because someone else tells me to do it. I should be good for the sake of being good. And I am good for the sake of being good when I love God who gave me the moral law and I love my brothers whom I know that are protected by this moral law from the evilness of others and of myself. So what I mean to tell is this, and that's why there is no contradiction of the law and of freedom if you live in the freedom of the children of God that see God as a good father, that gives this law as something that is good for myself. And so I, I do it for my own sake, because I know that it's good for myself. Right. Or, whereas if you are like a slave to the law and God is a master and he's there with a whip and he will cast me to hell if I don't fulfill the law and I cannot fulfill the law, well, this can only lead to resentment or this will lead to falling away of the faith. Or even if not, the person will be paralyzed. That's the scrupulosity, will be paralyzed, unable to progress in their faith. So again, the, that or, or the person will feel the, you know, the jealousy of the eldest son when the new son came uh, back to the merciful father's house. And the eldest son is like, uh, is he feels res resentment? Why? Because he did not for he, he says to the father, "Oh, he, I, 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 oh, I obey all your orders, and you don't even give me a lamb." So he only fulfilled the orders of the father because he was expecting a reward. He did not fulfill the orders of the father because his father was good and out of love for the father, because if he tended to the fields, he would have food on the table for himself. No, he didn't. He was expecting something else. And then there's this idea of punishment and reward. And some, if someone uh, receives a reward that is unjust or they feel like it's unjust because it comes from the mercy of God, then then they feel they they feel like they were they they were something was taken away from them that was rightfully owed to them and no god does not owe us anything so right. it's all of this all of this dynamic that shows that rigidity is not a proper antidote to laxity right 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 uh, but i mean Definitely, but but again, I uh, I do see the the other more extreme because I mean I don't know any Catholics that are coldly you know fulfilling their duties as Catholics. I think this was more of a reality, a pre-Vatican II reality. Uh, maybe again, this anecdotal, but I don't I don't see people coldly following the law without having that. At least today, of course, that is a danger for sure. Um, and maybe you see that as a dangerous reaction, but uh, the coldly following the law without having an interior spirit. I just think that's not where that's not the, where the problem lies for today. I think the problem lies in the overstressing of the mercy of God. And it's interesting because you you dedicate the book to St. Alfonso's Ligotti, who said um, a lot of people. Well, you have to qualify this, of course, but a lot of people are um, a lot of uh, a lot of people are condemned because of the quote unquote mercy of God. Right. Because of this kind of. Um, this uh, horizontalism applied to God and this lack of God not being a transcendent being. He's, he's my buddy. There's a lack of not not a not a fear in the sense of being scared of God, but there's this lack of 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 reverence of of respect towards God, and God is just purely on my level. I I, I am seeing more than that, uh, more of that, and and again more of this internalism that. Um, I kind of don't have to exteriorize as long as I have the interior spirit, which it is the goal, but we do need the exterior. I think we agree. All I'm saying is that I just think, again, I think it's a red herring, uh, unless in your circles you're seeing it a lot. And just because the people are are, are, are focusing more on the exterior, 
I, I think that the Pope is automatically targeting them because he sees them focusing on the exterior and, and in, a, in a cynical way, judging their interior. Because it's like, w w wait a minute, just because we're focusing on the exterior, like what are signs that we there's no interior spirit? Um, obviously, if, if they're instead of a Kantism, I believe that's, uh, that's that's a wrong position, right? You cannot reject the Pope, but but the criticisms of the Pope, I think a lot of some of them are are warranted. Um, you know, when he, for example, with his document on human fraternity, when he says, and he corrected himself actually, when a bishop uh, called him out on it, all all religions, the plurality of religions, are willed by God, and he corrected himself saying the the passive will or the permissive will rather of God. So. Things like this, um, uh, I, I think, uh, again, a, a golden mean kind of to go to what you're, um, to what you were saying, um, but but I want to I want to go to the notion of duty too because duty um, is there is duty and and freedom at odds because really and this is interesting I heard a, uh, a priest was preaching that the more duty you have the more free you are, but in a sense. Uh, you may based on Pope Francis, you kind of make them contrary, and really, because duty is not something uh, you don't do. Like you, you make duty something that's involuntary, but duty can very much be voluntary, and it could be done with the interior spirit of yes, this is my duty, um, but I also do it with the uh, the interior spirit, and it and it goes back to that's uh, because I teach, and a lot of students think that. Uh, my students think that, yes, the, the love of God, doing things for the love of God, yes, that's the perfect, that's the goal. But also what is good, a lesser good, the fear of the Lord, the fear of hell, right? And this is this is attrition opposed to contrition. This is something yes. that uh, that we minimally need to go to confession. So um, uh, kind of like, uh, yeah, the, this notion of duty, this notion of law, this notion of exterior works doesn't really have to contradict the interior kind of where does that come from like wh wh why do it, we it does, yeah go ahead no it doesn't need to contradict but mm. it can contradict and it right. does contradict sometimes um it's like i i perfectly uh, i liked perf uh, what you said about the distinction between attrition and contrition yes right. uh, attrition is acceptable not but it's not the goal Mm -hmm. and uh, it's not what we aim for. And if a person just can't, here it is, a person can accommodate themselves to attrition and then feel like, oh, attrition is good enough, so I don't need to go ahead with contrition. And here we see an obstacle to the progress of the faith. And... Uh, Regarding and here the duty and freedom is precisely the same thing. Is there a, a different? Uh, is there a conflict between the two? Not necessarily, but uh, if a person uh, and I believe that during the first steps of the journey of the faith, if a person does it out of duty and out of fear of hell and whatnot, that that's okay. But it's an intermediary step, just like attrition is towards uh, a more perfect. Um, a more perfect uh, following, which comes from the heart. So, mm -hmm. and uh, being attached too rigidly to the sense of duty might actually not be the best way uh, because uh, as I explained in my book, virtue, uh, uh, virtue is a natural, according to Thomistic Aristotelian ethics, which is a virtue ethics. It's not an ethics of the third person. Many uh, ethics, modern ethics are what we call an ethics of the third person in which, oh, there is a rule, you have to follow the rule. No, uh, Aquinas and Aristotle have a more, it's, have a virtue ethics, an ethics based on virtue. And virtue is an inclination towards the good. And the good is when the reason is attuned uh, to, the, to its proper end. So yes, you can. You, you can fulfill something out of duty, but if you only feel fulfill it out of duty, you're always going against what your what your reason wants. 
or what your will wants, because your reason is not attuned towards the good. Your reason is attuned towards the bad, and you still fulfill the law out of a sense of duty. But the goal is to attune your reason towards the goal to good so that you are inclined towards the good, so that you will will the good as much as a sinner wills the evil. And so the ethics will follow organically and naturally. So yes, as an intermediary step, attrition, a sense of duty, that's perfectly fine. But we cannot think that these are the perfection of the faith. And if we um, reject the, the proposal of this greater ideal, and if we reject the notion that what you have here is not, is impeding you from fulfilling this greater, uh, from perfecting yourself, then this is a bad rigidity. The, uh, if there is a rigidity that says, you just need to keep the attrition, and never, and if someone tells you that contrition is better, or if someone says that you should not continue on attrition, go to contrition. That is bad for your soul. That so that's a bad rigidity. And the same thing happens with a sense of duty and freedom. Yes, okay. Uh, if uh, it's fine as an intermediary step, maybe you will never be able to go beyond that. But you have to at least try to aim at that or at least know that there's something more. And if someone tells you, no, don't don't just keep yourself here. Just go there. You, this is the better way. You cannot say, oh, that's heresy. Oh, that's laxism. Oh, that's, that's a danger to your spiritual faith. That's a danger to the spiritual, to the spiritual path of, of people. Well, though, though Thomas did say virtuous people can just judge uh, justly. So if you're virtuous, I guess. <laughs> but but the thing, going back to virtue, um, you're right. It's not an act. It's a habit, an inclination. But it's caused. Right. It's caused. And, and it, 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 it continues to subsist by by exterior acts. So you cannot you cannot right. obtain virtue. That's why. Uh, and and that's what when you get in the use of reason, babies aren't virtuous, of course. But once you get the use of reason and you do rational acts, corresponding mm -hmm. acts, so you can then you then you obtain the virtue. So you cannot become courageous without a pattern of courageous acts. Sure. So obviously, this is a virtuous cycle, of course. But uh, I believe that the virtue, uh, of course, you can grow in virtue through training. But I think that the virtue is the thing that after that, the acts follow. The acts follow. So I think we have to strive for virtue uh, first and acts afterwards. And in fact, I just want to say that Amoris Letizia has a very very beautiful part it's i think it's chapter seven no one talks about the rest of the mortal it's always chapter eight but when pope francis talks about education of children he talks about that precisely instilling the sense of virtue instilling this inclination so it's very Thomistic aristotelian in that sense right uh, so yeah so another thing that i also that you also said before mm -hmm. Uh, is uh, has to be a, to do about mercy, right, right. and how there is a big misuse of the word mercy, and I can I can uh, in the book on my book on rigidity I also agree with you there there is a widespread misuse of the word mercy, but the point is does Pope Francis fall into that misuse, and from my studying of it. Uh, I believe not, because the misuse of mercy is that it, it's more like a denial of mercy because they, people seem, seem to think that, oh, God will just be okay with everything that I do. That's what a merciful God would do. Well, that's not mercy at all, because mercy means that you did something wrong. You cannot have mercy on someone who did not do anything wrong. If you if you do bad to that person, if you punish that person, uh, that's unjust. And if you withdraw the punishment from that person, it's not mercy, it's justice. So for you to have mercy, you have to have done something bad. And Pope Francis knows about this. Um, and this is a, a complete a, a detail that makes all the difference. 
And I uh, and let's just say that just like mercy can be misused to promote uh, to promote heresy, heterodoxy, sin, a lack of mercy can also, and that's also one of the chapters of my book about novationism and Pelagian Donatism, in which you know. Um, uh, the Donatists were so uh, lacking on mercy against people who had sinned. They apostatized under the Roman persecution. That was very serious. They said that God did not exist. They worshipped idols. That was uh, that was wrong. But they needed mercy. And the, the Catholic thing to do, as the church at the time said, as the Pope at the time said, who they, the Donatists said, was an impure pope, uh, the pope that should not be followed. But that pope discerned that, yes, you need to reopen the doors of the church to these people. Uh, but the Donatists and Novationists held so tightly to the law that they thought that mercy, that that it's interesting. I, 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 in my book, I, 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 I quote, I quote this debate between the Novationist Donatists on one side and the Catholics on the other. And the rhetoric is so alike to what we see today, in which the Donatists and the Novationists have these conceptions that are so similar to the traditions of today. So, yeah, we also have to look, be on the lookout that, yeah, I know that faithful Catholics might be more concerned about this abuse of mercy, but again, by reacting against a legitimate concern in too extreme a way, they end up on the opposite extreme. And that's what I find nowadays. Um, you said that anecdotally didn't see many in your circles, but I've seen it. I've seen it a lot. And probably uh, it's easier for me to see it because I actually co-founded <laughs> websites about right. trying to defend Pope Francis. So maybe I become like a lightning rod, but I see it and it's there. There's no way to deny it. Uh, and that's a problem, especially if these are the Catholics that are our men to evangelize the world. Yeah. The, the, the problem I see with Pope Francis is that a lot of his words, a lot of his words are even beautiful, but in the practice, like the mercy, for example, you don't see mercy applied to those who just want the traditional Latin Mass, for example, which is by the principle of longevity, yes, the, the church can um, reform its liturgy, but by the principle of longevity, I mean, that's a that's an ancient Mass. And even people who are not Catholic are saying this is, I mean, this is one of the sectors of Catholicism that's kind of booming demographically. And, and even for a CEO to kind of suppress that really makes no sense. As opposed to the Pope is being, he's very, very much decentralized liturgically in, in other aspects, being open to an, a type of Amazonic liturgy that has no tradition, uh, that has no um, precedence. So it's like, it, it's a very selective mercy that, um, you know, it, it's, it's applied one way, but not the other. So you do see uh, that uh, the Pope is again, kind of merciful to those kind of novelties, mercy, quote unquote, to novelties, but as opposed to those who want to maintain, and that's a very legit concern. I mean, I mean, even Pope Benedict XVI, which Pope Francis seems to do a 180 on with his new, the papal bull, Tradiciones Custodes, Benedict XVI realized the pastoral need, like where's the pastoral need for those who aren't rigid, let's let's use these categories, but who just want the traditional Latin Mass. I, I know plenty of people who have just, just became Catholic because they went to the Mass. So I don't know if they would be labeled uh, rigid necessarily by the Pope, but there isn't a mercy towards them because there's a, there's a kind of worldwide suppression of it. Um, which which the prior popes did not see. So it's kind of like a one-sided type of mercy. I don't know if you want to comment on that. And then another point, and then we'll kind of wrap this up. Uh, regarding that, uh, I also would like to go back to the that chapter of my book about the Donatists and the Novationists, mm -hmm. uh, in which, yeah, the, the they also thought, they also pointed at inconsistency. Why is the church so merciful towards those apostates and that's not merciful towards us well 
that's the thing. The problem is you can you will be judged according to measure that you are judged, and you cannot receive what you do not give. And if many uh, many of the I'm not saying that all traditionalists and all conservatives are like that, but there is a, a significant part of it that is being underestimated, uh, which does, and they are taking care, they are taking some control of that because they are in control also of the. They have a. They are a very. They are a very loud minority, but they are still very loud. And people get go back to the faith through the internet and they immediately get in contact with all of these people. So you cannot, you cannot spend your whole time making fun, deriding, rejecting, despising, accusing of heresy, notions like discernment, accompaniment, um, mercy and synodality and then when the tables are turned you say oh what about synodality for me synod mercy for me no you have to be consistent if you believe that those things do not apply then sorry you cannot ask them for yourself so uh i regarding the traditiones custodes i can i can say that there was a problem it's not like Pope Francis was elected and the following month or the following year he issued Tradiciones Custodes. Mm -hmm. There has been since 2016, arguably since his election, a consistent undermining, consistent every single every single thing that he said and did was taken out of context, shown to be very bad, that he was an evil pope, that he was a radical pope, or at least heterodox pope. So he, he actually, before Tradiciones Custodes, he actually spent a lot of time without doing anything, seeing if he could, if he could maintain the status quo of Pope Benedict. And Pope Benedict himself said that if there would be problems with the implementation of Sumorum Pontificum, proper venues would be taken to solve the problems. Now, uh, regarding the, regarding the, 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 for example, you mentioned before, he, Pope Francis' um, Pope Francis, uh, declaration on human freedom, which was a massive victory to get a high Muslim authority to sign on that because, you know, Catholics, Christians do not cannot worship properly in those Muslim uh, majority countries. So this was a major victory to have them sign that, and then we had you know, people uh, making a, a big controversy about these two words, which were you know it's not plurality, it's pluralism, which is uh, there is a difference that pluralism, the people being able to live with the other religious people as their brothers, is something willed by God. I, I agree with that. Even if I do not agree that God willed the other religion, I agree that uh, God might will that this uh, peaceful, uh, I know that traditions don't like that, uh, that word, but coexistence, okay? That does not mean that I do not follow my faith and then not try to show the errors of the other faith, but uh, it's good that we don't do it like by being at each other's throats, okay? So, but that's a, that's a, a beside the point. Regarding that declaration, yes, there was a bishop. Uh, it was Bishop Schneider uh, who came to Pope Francis and asked for a clarification. And Pope Francis clarified by using the distinction between uh, the passive will of God and the active will of God. And then what happened? Then what happened? Bishop Schneider, did Bishop Schneider and those who follow him accept that, that, that uh, correction? No, they did not. After a few months, Bishop Schneider was saying that simply this correction, simply this was not enough, that Pope Francis needed to retract it all. And now he's publishing a catechism that's, that is saying that uh, what, what the Vatican, that is teaching contrary to many of the things that Vatican II or Pope Francis have taught. So yeah, thus did clarify, merely clarifying is not enough. Now you ask me: Is restricting the Latin, the the TLM, uh, going to solve it? I don't know, 
but simply you know adjusting to them and accommodating to them has has not worked at all i i've seen it with my in my own eyes and experienced it throughout these years but so one last thing is that we need to make to understand this and this is something that i wrote on on my previous book heresy discuss tradition there is a chapter on the liturgy it's the roman right because it's the right that it's practiced by Rome. That's how it came about. So if people uh, get too adjusted to the rubric, too attached to the rubrics, and do not understand that the purpose of the Roman rite is to worship in unity with the Bishop of Rome, then they are not following tradition because what is traditional is that these people, many of these saints wanted the Roman rite during you know, the first millennium. They wanted the Roman rite because that was the rite that the Pope was celebrating. So if you are not celebrating the rite that the Pope is celebrating, you, the externals might be the same, but you're not following the tradition. It's a, an external that is devoid of, inter, of the internality. It's hollow. It's hollow. So not, I'm not saying again that all traditions are like that, but the overriding principle is unity. And if the TLM, the traditional act of mass, was sacrificing this unity, something needs to be done. And I keep telling people, and they don't, they don't, they don't, um, they don't agree with me, or they they refuse to believe me. If today all the people who want the Latin Mass said, we uh, agree with Pope Francis, with every single teaching of his living magisterium, with every single living teach, with every single teaching of the Vatican II. And we recognize that what we did during these past years was wrong but we want to make it right. Please don't take the TLM from us and we will make it right. We repent. If they did that today, tomorrow traditionalist custodians would be lifted, but they don't. They, when I tell them that, they get angry at me because it's there's this mental blockade that prevents them from doing that. And then I think, is it being, is the, this traditional mass being so good to them that it causes this mental blockade that they can't even understand that it's within their grasp? They just need to try to deal with the problem within their midst. Yeah, I don't, yeah if I could, I don't. if I could just, because uh, I mean, all your work is tied together uh, essentially, but I think the values are inverted. And here where I disagree, it's not the, the tradition, though, of course, the Pope. Uh, in his extraordinary, in ordinary magisterium, which we uh, give internal sin to, um, the Pope explicates, right, he's the, the defender of, as, as a principle of unity of tradition. So the, the Pope is bound by tradition. Tradition is not uh, bound by the Pope in that sense. So I think the 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 values are inverted. And for example, so there is, the, the, which you do mention here, of course, there's a development of doctrine. And it could be that um, our minds are kind of, you know, we say, oh, this sounds weird. We're not going to accept it. We don't accept the development. We do. Theology does develop, but development cannot be a 180. And I'll give you an example, like the notion with the death penalty. I mean, that's, uh, I mean, we're not going to get into all these topics. I'm just kind of getting to the generalities. Uh, that's a 180. So it's like, if I reject you, I have to reject the past. It's like, it's an either or. It goes against the principle of non-contradiction. It's not, there is no development. It is literal that I can clearly see a contradicting teaching, like death penalty, for example, um, or, or in a modus laetitia. And, and maybe we could end with this topic, which this is, uh, you, you wrote another work on that. And by that work, uh, interesting, also his first book, that's your first book, right? The Orthodoxy in a Mortis The uh, first apologetics book, yes. With When you mentioned the Judaizers, I think we can apply that to Pope Francis in, in the sense that he, uh, and you give me the nuance of this, but like uh, Mortis Laetitia 301. And I know this is from chapter eight, right? Because uh, the, the rest of Mortis Laetitia is, of course, is, is, is beautiful to read. It's very, it's like a book. It is a book, literally. 
but uh, the controversy is in there, and it does seem to be saying that you don't have to if you if you're subjectively convinced of your and it's, it's three hundred one. If if you're subjectively convinced of your um, uh, basically your moral standing, it's almost like the conscience having precedence over the 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 objective state. So here's a quote: uh, it, uh, "It can no longer simply be said that those in any quote unquote irregular situation are living in a state of mortal sin." Uh, and are deprived of sanctifying grace. More is involved here than mere ignorance of the rule. A subject may know full well the rule, yet have difficulty in understanding its inherent values or be in a concrete situation which does not allow him or her to act differently and decide otherwise without further sin. So this is a regular situation is adultery. So you mentioned this, this is intrinsic moral evil. There's no exception to this. But he does seem to allow uh, sub um uh, some type of exemption from this or an, an exception rather to this uh, intrinsic evil and and hence one can receive the communion so it's, it's allowing for a sense an hypocrisy so criticizing hypocrisy but here seeming to allow us again a, a lack of harmony between a subjective state and an objective state which is a double life ultimately Right, I, I believe I'm in grace, but I'm in objective uh, adultery. I have problems with that. I really don't. I really think I am in grace. Uh, I don't agree with this inherent, the the inherent belief of, of adultery or or, or or whatever. You know, I'm good with God, and uh, I ultimately receive communion. So, isn't that uh, that a double life? And uh, again, as I mentioned a lot of things. If you want to, and then we could kind of wrap it up on that because this is. It, we, I mean, this is kind of like the overall uh, issue here, really. Um, I think that this harmony between the internal and external, which I find fascinating. I find it really fascinating, the spiritual life. And I do appreciate in your book how you, and, and it's actually helped me, um, because I tend to focus on, uh, in many aspects, on the extrinsic, to foment the internal life. So basically, we don't want a separation. We want a synthesis. We want to sense how do we make that synthesis? But again, here in Pope Francis, if you want to address this, if you want to address what I said before about the tradition and the Pope being bound to tradition, um, feel free to. Okay, so there's lots of to unpack there, but I yeah. think that <laughs> I can I can actually wrap things up by by taking these examples. So mm -hmm. because the, our main disagreement here is that you, it's I do not believe it's an either or. I do not believe that there was an actual contradiction, for example. Yes, intrinsically evil acts cannot be practiced. That's still on the table. But Pope St. John Paul II himself wrote in Veritatis Splendor, in the Catechism, Evangelium Vitae even, about abortion. Even intrinsically evil acts have different degrees of culpability. And the uh, if a person is not fully culpable, then that person might be not not be in mortal sin. That is not a contradiction. Otherwise, the contradiction lies with John Paul II himself. No, well, because one thing is the objectivity of the sin, which is is the sin justified in any circumstance? No, it's not. But are every, is everyone in every circumstance culpable enough? Out of ignorance. That's what that that um, quote from three hundred one uh, Amoris Laetitia three hundred one means. But he said regarding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. But he he kind of says no. For, forget even uh, like he says the subject knows full well. So he he's 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 giving full knowledge. He's giving a, he's, yeah. He's giving a different interpretation of what full knowledge is about. I, that's what I write on the book. It's not just that you you know. You, if you tell, you can tell the person adultery is evil and they will say, yeah, I agree with you. Okay. Now, but then you tell them, oh, but now uh, uh, you have remarried another woman and uh, you are divorced. So that's adultery. And they say, no, that's not adultery. So because I've divorced the person, divorce, uh, he accepts the, he accepts the, the secularized view. So yeah, is this person who has been formed and educated all his life in the secularized mindset, uh, fully ignorant, fully um, 
fully knowledgeable of the Catholic faith if you just tell him, oh, this is what the church teaches. No, he might not be able to know, and we know that in Catholic teaching and even in biblical teaching, the word to know is much more deep than just knowing something. Um, th that's not, that's still fully, that's still not fully culpable. And again, it's not an exemption. It's just an ascertainment of the culpability of the subject, not a justification of his actions regarding the death penalty. It's not that we are saying now that the death penalty is intrinsically evil. It's that we believe that the death penalty has served its purpose, but now we don't need it anymore. And John Paul II, Benedict XVI, tried to abolish it. But though many people use this technicality to try to thwart these abolitionist uh, endeavors of the popes. Oh, yeah, but the death penalty is not intrinsically evil, so I can disregard this. So Pope Francis closed that loophole, and he did not say intrinsically evil. It just says it's inadmissible. Just because something it, intrinsically evil means that Something cannot be justified in any circumstance. The death penalty was justified in the past, but mm -hmm. nowadays we don't need it anymore. So that does not mean that we there will always be at all times uh, 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 an epoch in which at least one case of the death penalty is acceptable. So there might be come a time when the death penalty, if, even though not intrinsically evil, all instances of the death penalty in that age in are not admissible. So that's what, and so there is, again, there seems to be a contradiction, but there is not. And this brings me back to the, the inversion of the values about the Pope is the one subject to tradition and tradition is, okay, but here, here again, for example, with the Roman rites, there are two competing interpretations. Interpretation of the traditionist who thinks that tradition is following the liturgical practice with the rubrics as they were always. And there is my tradition in which the Roman rite developed as the right of the, of the Bishop of Rome and people adopted the Roman rite because of that. So if you are not following the right of the Bishop of Rome, even if you follow externalities that were practiced prior, you are not following tradition. So what I, the gist of my book, Heresy Disguised Tradition, is that tradition, just like scripture, is not, um, what's the, the term? It's not something that uh, per perspicuous. That's why you need an interpreter. Just like in scripture, oh, po Protestants will say the popes are contradicting scripture when they allow statues. Here is scripture saying that you cannot have statues we have an authoritative interpreter. So it's not that, yes, the Pope is bound to tradition because the tradition is the deposit of the faith, it's the word of God. But the Pope is the authoritative interpreter of tradition. And this only happens because tradition is something that requires an interpreter. You cannot simply go to the primary source and rely on your private judgment and think that you are following tradition just because you're following to the latter. And that's that's the that's the the gist of it. So I do not agree that there are contradictions. If you study all the nuances and the complexities of the question, you see that it's it's not A and non A. It's A and B, and B seems like non A, but it's not. So there is no contradiction. But the Pope interpreted tradition according to this, the principle of the distinction between mortal and venial sins because of full ignorance and uh, invincible ignorance and uh, lack of consent, this is traditional. Just like, you know, uh, if Pope Francis in Fratelli Tutti also mentions many popes, even before the medieval popes developed the notion that death penalty might be acceptable, many popes during the first centuries, they said that, on the uh, uh, you should err on the side of mercy, and they they told their the magistrates of that time to not practice the death penalty. So again, there are tra the, the tradition is something much richer, much more complex than it, what it seems, and that's why we need a church. Otherwise, we would not need it. We would just consult all these old documents, and that was it. 
So that's the point. I do not believe that Pope Francis has contradicted tradition. He has contradicted some notions of tradition, but he has authoritatively interpreted a, the tradition in a way that goes against those notions. So his, for me as a Catholic, that his interpretation is the one that prevails. That's interesting you mentioned that with the death penalty, because I thought the argument was that we have become, we have realized better today the dignity of the human person, because it does, yes. it does it to D also, he says, there's no stepping back from this, from labeling it inadmissible. So he doesn't believe it's uh, like he could historically uh, go back to being admissible. He, he. I mean, you. I guess you can interpret it as intrinsically wrong, but I guess it's from a development of um, a more of a deeper awareness, if you will, of human mm -hmm. dignity. But I mean, it's yeah. like just to, to wrap things up. It's like people say, hear him say that it's against the logic of the gospel, and they think, oh, this means that it's sinful. That this means that it's intrinsically evil. But if you think about it. There are many things who go against the logic of the gospel, who which are not intrinsically evil. But of, uh, I have a right to seek uh, justice uh, uh, within certain moral bounds against my against someone who is my enemy. Sure, is that the logic of the gospel? It's not. <laughs> so. Uh, th that's the point. The logic of the gospel, uh, th that's precisely what I also write in the book. The Pharisees stuck to the law and said, oh, thou shall not commit adultery. That's fine. Oh, th thou shall not murder. That's awesome. But Jesus went uh, a step further and said, uh, okay, it's not just do not commit adultery. Do not look to a woman uh, with lust or do not just murder. Don't harbor any hate against your brother. Right. Right. That's the logic of the gospel, uh, and it's it goes beyond the you can you cannot. It's more like you should or you shouldn't. So against again the death penalty, I think that it hinders our test our witness as Catholics, and even uh, that, that's something that I also always thought it's very fascinating is King David killed all those Philistines. And it was considered in the Bible a holy war because the Philistines were wicked. They, they, they oppressed. But by killing the Philistines, King, even though he was justified in doing so, God never gives any, any, any uh, indication that David was wrong in what he did. But just that made David not be worthy of the building the temple. It will, it had to be Solomon, the next generation. So uh, keeping ourselves attached to this procedure, when all almost all of the rest of the world and mostly the civilized countries uh, you, you, the, um, have gold, most of them at least, have gotten beyond it, clinging to it, our, hinders our witness and I also think it pollutes our souls. We are as Catholics probably uh, called to go beyond what we can or cannot do. It's what we should or shouldn't. There's the purpose of discernment. Right, right, right. Oh, so fascinating. We could literally talk the whole day about this because there's so much that this, you know, that it entails. But um, maybe I can have you on in a future show if you would be interested. Sure. Love having these conversations. Um, we don't fully agree, but we do agree that the Pope, the principle of unity, we have to love the Pope. We have to pray for the Pope. We have mm -hmm. to, obviously, you're only Catholic if you're, you recognize no set of a contism, uh, no good. And definitely the, the internal is what takes precedent. The external through the internal, that's for sure. And definitely get Pedro Gabriel's book, Rigidity, Faithfulness, or Heterodoxy. Very interesting read. And it's not, uh, so this is in route. It may seem kind of formidable with how thick it is, but it's really, it's, it's not that many words per, per page. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's very readable. And uh, his style is not like mine, which is difficult to read. <laughs> so his style is very, very, goes with a nice flow. And check out his other books too, The Orthodoxy of Moris Laetitiae and her Heresy Disguised as Tradition. Well, Pedro Gabriel, thank you for coming on, sir. And uh, until next time, God bless you. God bless you too.